Major, known as El Francis, a serial killer whose crimes shocked Restoration Spain at the beginning of the 20th century. With a list of six victims in the macabre modus operandi, Juan Andres Aldaige and his accomplice, José Muñoz Lopra, sowed terror in the town of Penaflor, Seville. Preying on their unwary, they would take them to their illegal gambling house and then carry out brutal murders in order to steal their winnings. A young newspaper, the ABC, closely followed this series of crimes, keeping public opinion aware of the growing concern about the chronicle of events in Spain. Find out how these ruthless killers operated for four years before finally being stopped. Join us in this disturbing investigation as we explore the details of the crimes and the development of the investigation that led to the capture of El Francis and his accomplice. A dark chapter in the criminal history of Spain that will not leave you indifferent. Get ready to unravel the hidden mysteries behind El Francis in this exciting episode of La Criminotica. Do not forget to give it a thumbs up if you have been intrigued by this case and subscribe to the channel to receive more content on criminology and historical events. Let's get started. Juan Andres Aldaige Monmeja, alias El Francis. Classification, Serial Killer. Features, Robberies. Number of Victims, 6. Date of Crime, 1900-1904. Date of Arrest, December 19, 1904 Date of Birth, 1850 Victims, Jose Lopez Almila, Benito Mariano Burgos, Enrique Fernandez Cantalapedra, Federico Lamas de la Torre, Felix Bonilla Padilla, and Miguel Regano Espejo Method of Crime, Beating with a Crowbar and a Hammer Location, Penaflor, Seville, Spain Status, executed by Garot on April 1, 1906. Between 1898 and 1904 two residents of the town of Penaflor hammered six people to death with the sole purpose of robbing them. 119 years have passed since a crime that shocked Restoration Spain thanks to the exhaustive monitoring of it by a young newspaper created two years earlier, the ABC. A newspaper that, in addition to defending the monarchy, maintained from its founding, in 1903, until the Civil War a special concern for showing the chronicle of events as a differentiating element compared to its rivals. The crimes of the French Garden were a series of six murders committed in the Seville town of Penaflor by Juan Andres Aldaige Monmeja, known locally as El Francis for being a native of the Gallic town of Egin, and by his accomplice José Muñoz Lopra. The murders were widely spaced in time. The first, that of José López, a native of Jane, was committed in 1898. The last, the only one that was investigated and through which they discovered the macabre business that El Francis had set up, was that of Miguel Regano Espejo, a native of Posadas, Córdoba, that took place in 1904. The only purpose that Aldaige pursued, together with his buddy José Muñoz Lopra, was to rob the unwary who came to try their luck in his illegal gambling house after having done good business with the sale of his agricultural and livestock products. The way of working was always the same. Munoz Lopra contacted travelers who had made transactions and had cash and took them to the gambling house of Del Francis. This was in the municipality of Penaflor, about 80 kilometers from Seville. There, in the house next to an orchard he owned, Egens had some tables dedicated to playing cards and, if they were lucky, he would let them bet on a roulette wheel that, the buddy said, could win large amounts of money. Because only the wealthiest gambled. When the unsuspecting were taken to the house located on the outskirts of the town, next to an orchard surrounded by a wall, they were led through a dark corridor where, having reached an agreed point, they warned them to be careful not to stumble with a pipe sticking out of the ground. When the victim lowered his head to see the obstacle in the middle of the darkness, they hit him with an iron bar that they had named, the doll, and finished him off with a pointed hammer with which they trepanned his skull. After robbing their victim, they buried the bodies in the orchard. 
Thus they managed to steal 28,300 pesetas from their six victims. As they recognized at trial, the booties they obtained were of very diverse importance. They stole 3,000 pesetas from Jose Lopez, 8,000 from Mariano Burgos, 300 from Enrique Fernandez Cantola Pedra, 4,000 from Ferrerico Lamas, 6,000 from Felix Bonilla and 7,000 from Miguel Regano Espejo. It was Regano's disappearance, and the interest shown by his wife and a cousin of the victim, that triggered an investigation that would end up uncovering the first serial crime of the 20th century in Spain. After the disappearance of her husband, Francisca Marquez asked for help from a cousin of his, it was Juan Mojadano, the blacksmith from the Cordoba town of Posadas. A stocky and thoughtful man who, upon learning the details of the disappearance of his family member, decides to go personally to Seville to try to find him. His suspicion, as he stated in his statement during the trial, was that Miguel Regano had decided to go on a spree with the 28,000 reals with which he had gone to Seville to buy cattle. Nobody knows anything. The first place Mojadano went to was the pension where his cousin was staying during his visits to Seville. It was the Fonda del Batiste, there they told him that during the first night he spent there the disappeared person had come into contact with Munoz Lopra, from Penaflor, with whom he left the next day to return alone that afternoon. Pay the bill and leave permanently in company of a friend of Mojadano's named Borrego, according to other testimonies Borreguero. The next day Mojadano met with Munoz Lopra, who told him that the only contact he had with his cousin had been a negotiation for the purchase of a casino roulette wheel, but since the money he had offered was little, they did not arrive. To complete the operation. The story did not convince the blacksmith who, back in Seville, contacted a former police officer turned private detective named Rodriguez who moved freely in the criminal environments of the Andalusian capital. In a few hours he located the people with whom Regano was playing, Jose Borrego, or Borreguero, Jose Moya, El Pina, and two other people related to illegal card games. El Pina confirmed to them that Munoz Lopra was one of the main organizers of illegal timbas and that, when he wanted discretion about the amounts that were going to be played, he organized them at the house in the Orchard of Francis, a good friend of his who lived in Penafor. Mojadano later met with the civil governor, whom he gave an overview of the progress made in the private investigation. Another officer was launched, which soon proved slow and ineffective. Faced with this situation, the former police officer Rodriguez decided to publish a series of letters to the editor in the newspaper El Liberal in which he told the story. This initiative led the judge of Laura del Rio, to whom Penaflor was administratively dependent, to take a statement from Munoz Lopera and L. Francis, who were released after responding. A mysterious clue. The wife of the disappeared person then began, according to her statement, to receive anonymous letters in which she was asked for money minus 250 pesetas in exchange for information on the whereabouts of her husband. Faced with her refusal, according to Francisca Marquez, one night they told her anonymously, through her bedroom window, that her husband was in Penaflor, that he was buried in the orchard. This fictional episode was later shown to be a ruse by former police officer Rodriguez to force a search for the body in the orchard. The ruse worked and Mojadano was authorized to carry out the search himself in the presence of a civil guard corporal. For this, he devised a very ingenious system that consisted of introducing a steel rod, which he himself sharpened and prepared in his smithy, up to a meter deep, to later extract it and smell it. When it was about to get dark they carried out a tasting next to the area where the rabbits were and, when they extracted the stick, the smell they perceived was unmistakable. They decided not to waste time and, in the middle of the night in the light of some carbide lanterns, they dug until they found a corpse. It was in an advanced state of decomposition and it was not Miguel Regano's. Faced with this discovery, the judge decided to authorize an excavation of the entire orchard, which had two bushels, just under one and a half hectares, revealing a total of six corpses. The one from Regano came out in fourth place, in the area where the fruit trees were. 
Munoz Lopra was arrested on the spot, but when the civil guard wanted to arrest El Francis, he had escaped and was trying to cross the Portuguese border. When he learned that his family could face reprisals, he turned himself in to stand trial. The trial was a show with all the incentives. Munoz Lopra went on a hunger strike, the two defendants fought in the courtroom and had to be fined for contempt, the statements did not match since each one blamed the other for being the material author of the deaths. Finally they were sentenced, each of them, to six death sentences. The popular tradition, to which in Spain too much credibility is given, has left the myth of the response that the Frenchman gave upon hearing the sentence, why six, if one is enough. Be that as it may, the execution was also a spectacle. At 7 in the morning on October 31, 1906, the two condemned men were taken to the gallows. To avoid problems, the executioner from Madrid had moved to help the executioner from Seville. Both were ineffective in their duties and had to squeeze the vile club several times, which caused the two condemned men to die in strong convulsions. And the break came. In 1977, in full bloom of the uncover cinema that characterized our transition, the macabre events of the Orchard of El Francis were taken to make a film that achieved a good setting. But, demands of the script, meat had to be shown, and the more the better. That is why the director, Paul Nashi, decided that an illegal casino was not good for playing turn the house of the Frenchman into a brothel in which the beauties of the time showed their charms. To embody the pupils of the brothel, Nashi had Maria Jose Cantudo, Agata Liss, Julia Saley and Silvia Tortosa. Two popular expressions have remained in Spanish society, which were born from the crimes of Penaflor. The statement of, taking someone to the garden, when someone is tricked into acting as you wish, even if forced to go against their interests. The second, this is going to end up like the Frenchman's Orchard, very popular among our transition politicians, perhaps more as a result of the Paul Nashi film than because of the events of the beginning of the century. In this case, what our forefathers were referring to was that things would not end well and could end in tragedy. Expansion of the case, the crimes of the Huerto del Francis. The disappeared person who went to Seville. Mojadano, the blacksmith detective. Pepe Munoz, from Penaflor. The Night of the Coffee News with Pepe Moya, El Pina. The Anonymous to the Wife of Miguel Regano. A Mysterious Hand Knocking on the Window. The Orchard of Skulls. A telegram arrives at the forge of Juan Mojadano, a master blacksmith on La Rambla, a small town located on a hillock in the Cordoba countryside, near Montilla. The hammer stops for a moment on the bigamy. It is November 15, 1904. The blacksmith leaves what he is doing to collect the shipment. He is from Posadas and is sent by Francisca Marquez, his cousin's wife. The message is for help, Miguel disappeared two days ago. Nobody knows about him. Come. When she arrives at her cousin's house, she tells her that Miguel went to Seville taking all the money he had at home, almost 28,000 reis that Juan Mojadano himself sent him from a wheat sale. According to what he told Francisca, he planned to be back the same weekend. The woman fears the worst. Juan Mojadano decides to approach the matter calmly. He doesn't want to rush into notifying the police in case his cousin is involved in a mess that he doesn't want to report. He goes to Seville where a good friend directs him to an ex-policeman who continues to carry out investigations on his behalf. This is Loriano Rodriguez, who agrees to collaborate to clarify Reggiano's strange disappearance. At the Fonda del Batiste they tell him that the first day his cousin spent there, José Muñoz Lopra, from Penaflor, came looking for him, with whom he left. And the second night he went out with another man, a certain Borrego, after having paid the bill. Penaflor is a town in Seville close to the province of Córdoba. It is only 54 kilometers from Córdoba and 74 from Seville. By the time Reggiano disappeared, 
it had some 3,500 inhabitants who were mostly dedicated to growing cereals and raising sheep, goats, pigs, and horses. Its fertile fields are irrigated by the Guafalquivir that converges there with the Genil. When Mohadano visits José Muñoz, he receives him courteously. He explains that what he discussed with his cousin was the purchase of a roulette wheel. He tells her that they had been discussing the price all night and that the next day he received a letter from Rajano making the latest offer that was still very low. Mohadano, the detective blacksmith, finds everything very strange. Even the letter from his cousin seems false. Back in Seville, Mohadano meets with the ex-policeman who tells him that he has located the young man who was with his cousin the last night he was seen. It is about Jose Borrego, a gambling hook, who had once worked with Regano when he went to the fairs playing the deck. According to his account, that night they were together at the Café Novedades, a place for flamenco fans. Regano was there with Pepe Moya, El Pina, another one who was always hanging around the gossip, and with two other strangers who gave the impression of handling money. Borrego asked him to let him in on what he was preparing and Reggiano told him that it was a mysterious game, but that they would talk the next day, which is why he went to look for him. In the end he couldn't get into the game because he was full. In the most important cafe in Penaflor, Los Esajanos, the blacksmith detective found a waiter who confirmed that Jose Munoz was dedicated to organizing clandestine parties. And that when he organized them in Penaflor, he did them in the Huerto del Francis, which is far from town. The owner and Munoz were very close friends. Mohadano decides to put the matter in the hands of the civil governor, but the official investigations are very slow. He arrives in November without knowing anything new. Then the former police officer Rodriguez publishes a letter in El Liberal of Seville in which he recounts the mysterious disappearance of Miguel Reggiano. The publication adorns the drama with romantic overtones. The expectation increases with a second letter in which the ex-policeman gives an account of new information that he knows. As a result of this, the Laura judge interrogates José Muñoz Lopera and sends the civil guard to take a statement from the French. On December 9, one Andrés Aldige Monmeja, 54 years old, a native of Agen, France, El Francis, appeared before Corporal Aldaya, from Penaflor. After his statements, the two friends are released. There is no progress in the disappearance of Reggiano. Probably the case would have been paralyzed forever if an unforeseen event had not occurred, the anguished Francisca Marquez receives two anonymous letters. In them she offers information about her husband in exchange for $50. Since she doesn't pay attention, at dawn a mysterious hand knocks on her bedroom window, let them look for your husband in Penaflor, an unknown voice tells her. The woman deposits an envelope in which she promises money if they advance more information. The answer is not long in coming, your husband is buried in the garden, she tells him. When justice wants to find Aldeich to answer these accusations, he has already fled. The orchard called, the Frenchman, was of fair size. It occupied an area of two bushels and was enclosed by high brick walls. It had orange, lemon, pomegranate and olive trees. There were also jasmine and rose bushes. And a strange house that curiously had no openings in the part that faced the field. However, on the back facade there were 14 windows and a door leading to the kitchen. Mohadano, accompanied by the corporal of the civil guard and a friend carried out a detailed probe with some iron rods that he had brought from his blacksmith shop. His purpose was favored by the recent rains that had softened the earth. Helped by the corporal, he sank the rods into the ground and extracted them to sniff them in case they had any trace of odor. On December 14 they dedicated the whole day to this task, covering almost the entire garden. By late afternoon, exhausted and disappointed, they decided to continue the next day. But as he passed through the rabbit hutches, Mohadano had a hunch he asked his friend to stop there, at the foot of some pomegranate trees. Pulling out the bar, an unmistakable stench came out. 
They immediately picked up their hoes and began to dig. With the first shadows of the night they found a skull that showed its teeth in the light of the oil lamp. It had a large fracture in the right temporal bone and was so emaciated that it was immediately clear that it could not belong to Regano. They then became aware that this was a clandestine cemetery. In the days that followed, another five bodies appeared. The room, which was next to some orange trees, was that of the much sought after Miguel Regano. The other five were identified as belonging to Jose Lopez Almila, Benito Mariano Burgos, Enrique Fernandez Cantalapedra, Federico Lamas and Felix Bonifia. The judge issued an arrest warrant against Jose Munoz Lopera and his brother, Manuel, whom he would later find innocent and release. He also issued a search and arrest warrant against the fugitive Juan Andres Aldige and imprisonment for his eldest son, Victor Aldige, who would be proven innocent. Likewise, he imprisoned Aldige's second wife, Eloisa Melendez, who had nothing to do with it. Meanwhile, the fugitive Aldige, the fearsome Frenchman, had escaped from Penaflor on foot to the nearby town of Palma del Rio, from where he took the train to Tosina and Palm determined to reach Badajoz, from there to Portugal and then to Brazil. However, when he found out from the newspapers that his wife and his son had been imprisoned, he suspended his escape, he returned to Penaflor and turned himself in. The procedure of the crimes was always the same, Jose Munoz Loper captured the victims among lovers of roulette and cards with the story that they were going to fleece the Frenchman, who passed for a rich man passionate about gambling. Once in the orchard, taking advantage of the night, given the clandestine nature of the parties, while they were going in file along the narrow path that led to the house, the Frenchman, who always stood behind the guest, held an iron bar which he had wrapped in rags so that it would not slip and which he called, the doll, and when he reached an agreed point he would shout, Pepe, watch out for the pipe, and when the victim bowed his head, in a reflex act to looking at the ground. He unloaded a strong blow with, the doll, on the head and finished him off with a hammer that he had prepared. However, in the process, Munoz Lopera and Aldige accused each other of being the material authors of the deaths. The anonymous letters received by the wife of the disappeared man could have been sent by Borrego who, when Reggiano denied her entry into the fateful game, decided to follow in her footsteps, seeing how she entered the orchard. And even he could hear how they killed him. The blows were not accurate and the victim had time to shout, Oh, Mare de mi Arma. During the judicial process, Munoz Lopra wanted to let himself starve while Aldige took the opportunity to rectify his first statement and place all the blame on his buddy. The two were sentenced to six death sentences, one for each of the murders. They went up to the gallows at seven in the morning on October 31, 1906. The first was Munoz Lopra. Neither of the two executioners who acted from the courts of Seville and Madrid showed skill in handling the club. Sitting on the bench, Lopera passed away in horrible convulsions. The second executioner, also embarrassed and inexperienced, failed with the screw to the point that the Frenchman, after the first squeeze, displaying a special cynicism, with his neck embraced by the iron bowtie, still had the mood to tell him, didn't I tell you to push hard? The case should have started, according to the oral trial, with the first murder, that of Jose Lopez Almila, which occurred on the night of August 4, 1900. The hearing was held in Seville on March 6, 1906, and it lasted a long time. The two defendants were executed by means of the vile club in the provincial prison of Seville in the early morning of April 1, 1906. And the events occurred in this way. One Andres Aldige, alias L. Francis, had a fenced orchard, in which there was a simple building, with a little room and a kitchen, where a group of friends used to meet, sometimes, to play cards, especially in the evening. Modality of the Mountain It seems that, the Frenchman, was called one Andres Duel and he arrived from France forced by a fraudulent bankruptcy, for which he was sentenced and perhaps it was due to this change of name. 
Having made the appropriate inquiries, the police learned that, the Frenchman, did not have an honest and visible income, but that he lived with ease and ease. For this reason, those who knew one Andres Aldeich did not stop thinking badly of him and since it was known that cards were played in his garden, where the unwary would collapse, the individual's fame was terrible. El Francis had as a playing partner an individual named Jose Munoz Lopera, also a resident of Penaflor, like him, who had been nicknamed El Mosca Verde and El Manzana, who was an accomplished advantage player. The game is usually honest fun of lots of people. But when it becomes a passion and a vice, it causes many misfortunes. And both Juan and his friend Jose Munoz Lopra were one of those gamblers, misnamed professionals, who always wanted to take the winnings, whether by doing sleight of hand, juggling, or simple cheating. The point was not to lose the money they had and take that of their opponents. But this is sometimes not easy, if the player who is sitting in front knows as much or more than one, or does not allow himself to be fleeced as a fool. And perhaps for this reason, Penaflor's two friends had the idea of killing their gambling companions and stealing their money if they lost. And what was initially a simple scam, because the penal code specifies it in its section on advantage games, would become premeditated murder, treachery, nocturnal activity and other aggravating circumstances. According to statements by, The Green Fly, one day, his friend, the French, referring to his orchard, where he was, said something like. What a magnificent place this is for an Englishman to come with a wallet full of bills. If we can't win him the money, we give him ten shots and even steal his life. Taking the suggestion of his friend as a joke, Munoz replied. Of course, the site is good to play and do what you want. The only thing missing is English with the pasta. This is how the horrendous business must have started. First with ironic words, and then, little by little, becoming more precise, weighing the pros and cons, and finally moving from said to fact. Jose Munoz Lopra would later declare that his friend's idea did not seem good to him and he rejected it outright. However, since they saw each other every day and the Frenchman continued to harass him, he ended up being convinced and submitted to the other's will, saying that he dominated him. The plan that one Andres Aldeich had hatched forced Jose Munoz Lopera to travel frequently, visit towns and meet people who liked the game. Once contact was established, he proposed that she go to Penaflor, where he was gambling heavily with a group of cousins, among whom was the owner of an orchard they called the Frenchman. Jose Munoz painted the mountain games as something out of a dream, where he could win more than 50,000 pesetas in one night. Consider the amount and compare it with the purchasing power of the turn of the century and it will be understood that more than one fan of the game would open their eyes wide. It also happened that the Penaflor railway station was not far from the fateful orchard and the unsuspecting person who came used to do it alone or was discreetly received by his host, who accompanied him without being seen much. Thus, when the business began, the first to take the bait was the neighbor of Lopera, Jane, Jose Lopez Almila, who left his house, under the pretext of going shopping in Cordoba and did not he saw him again. The relatives of this individual, realizing that he was late, turned to the authorities, hospitals, acquaintances and relatives, and ended up reporting his disappearance in court. Nothing worked. Someone even said that the disappearance of Lopez Almila had been voluntary, and because of skirts. The justice made inquiries, but nothing was achieved. That man seemed to have been swallowed by the earth. Some time later Don Mariano Benito Burgos, a resident of Madrid, disappeared, whose fate was the same as José López Almila, since his corpse would end up being found in the orchard of El Francis, but, for now, no one was able to find him. His Whereabouts The third individual was called Enrique Ferno Cantalapedra V, although we do not have data on where he lived or where he was born, we do know about him that before leaving home with 270 pesetas in his pocket, a somewhat insignificant amount to go play in Penaflor, he told his wife what his destiny was, because he was meeting José Munoz Lopra. 
alias El Mosca Verde. And when Enrique Femendez Cantala Piedra disappeared, his wife wrote to Munoz Lopera, without receiving a convincing letter. The fourth victim was Federico Lamas de la Torre, a native of Jane, who suffered the same fate as the previous ones. He was followed by Felix Bonilla Padilla, from Prigo, Cordoba, and closed the list by a certain Miguel Regano, a resident of Posadas, Cordoba. The system for carrying out the murders was always the same, according to a statement by Jose Munoz himself. Those who were lucky enough to win, which was not frequent, were made to leave through the back of the orchard, telling them that it was not prudent to go out through the front, since some of the losers who had already left, could be waiting nearby from there, with a razor in hand. And when we got close to a wild rose bush that exists next to a water wheel, right next to the house, El Francis would tell me, be careful, Pepe, that this man doesn't trip over the pipe. I repeated the warning to the visitor and he lowered his head to avoid tripping. Then, El Francis struck him on the right side of the head. Right there was a hammer with a long handle and a lot of weight, with which I had to finish off the victims. I never used it. El Francis, naturally, gave a completely different version to that of his accomplice, reversing the roles. Then, according to the explanation of both, he took off the victims' jackets and vests, stripping them of money and jewelry. In this way they managed to find out that many of those murdered were gamblers who carried hidden cards in their clothes. The clothes were burned and the money and valuables were shared between them. The corpses were carried on stretchers to the other end of the orchard, where one Andres Aldige had already prepared the grave, and where they were buried, covered with a layer of quicklime. They were buried well and someone even said that a small response was prayed for them. That was the way many interesting games used to end in the orchard of the Frenchman. The strange disappearances soon began to make people talk. And it is not uncommon for wives, children and relatives to try to move heaven and earth to find those who, in some way, were the breadwinners of their families. The fact is that the investigating judge of Laura del Rio, the judicial district to which Penaflor belongs, began by connecting the dots and found a significant fact, and it was that all the disappeared had a point of coincidence, that is, the game. Alerted the police and the civil guard, a very extensive information service was set up and the records of all the disappeared were obtained. Closer and closer, the examining magistrate tied all the loose ends and recalled that two of the women of the disappeared had written to the same person, in Penaflor. On the one hand, it became known that all those who disappeared were considered notable advantage players and since the disappearances had occurred during the course of the last two years, the siege gradually closed. The judge gathered information from the most notable players in the region and paid particular attention, among others, to the names of José Muñoz Lopra, alias El Mosca Verde, something like a fecal detritus sucker, and his friend Juan Andrés Aldige, alias the Frenchman, whom he had brought to his presence, for preliminary inquiries. On the other hand, as the reputation of both individuals was disastrous and in Penaflor the rumor had spread that the disappeared could be buried in the orchard of El Francis, the investigating judge ordered the orchard to be searched and some holes to be made in it. Ground, without discovering anything. But since while the authorities carried out the search and the tastings in the orchard, El Francis took the ones from Villa Diego, disappearing from the town, the rumors increased and suspicion began to take shape, for which the authorities ordered a more detailed search. Especially the orchard, which was already publicly said to be a clandestine cemetery. Finally, a body appeared, and at the same moment a search and arrest warrant was issued against Juan Andres Aldige and José Muñoz Lopra, who were still in Penaflor and who, visibly sunken, were arrested without offering the slightest resistance. Meanwhile, two more corpses appeared in the orchard and the remaining three the next day. Almost the entire orchard was uprooted, trying to find more victims, but the number of six could not be increased. Autopsies were carried out, however, and it was reported that all had died in the same way, that is, from head trauma and right parietal trauma, due to blows from a very hard object 
probably a hammer, similar to the one found in the same orchard and that, although it had been laid, bloody vestiges could still be found in it. L. Francis was arrested three days after the arrest of José Muñoz and the indignation of the people was so great that the civil guard had to protect their lives from a just lynching, since swift and exemplary justice was sought. After the detainees were taken to the Penaflor town hall, the two ruffians began to accuse each other, pointing to each other as the one who was beating the victims, thus obviously trying to minimize their actions and aggravate the situation of the other, thinking, perhaps, that the best would escape the hands of the executioner. The reconstruction of the facts, therefore, was very easy. According to José Muñoz, L. Francis was the one who carried out the blows, and the other accused Muñoz. During the trial, which we will deal with now, the lawyer Federico Herrero, as private accuser named by the widow and children of Miguel Reggiano, the last of those murdered and buried in the orchard of El Francis, exposed in full detail the homicide, described as brutal murder, and said. Dash El Francis dealt a tremendous blow to the head of Reggiano, who fell to the ground crying out in pain, oh, my God, and that Munoz finished him off with the hammer, searching his clothes next and robbing him. But let's not precipitate events. The oral trial would not be held until March 6, 1906. But from the first offense to the last two years elapsed. The lengthy process was due to a series of delaying circumstances that put the judicial authorities at risk of failure, since it soon became apparent that it would be difficult to convict one of the culprits. The summary could have been concluded in three months. But José Muñoz Lopera, the green fly, felt such a terrible shock that he apparently lost his health and acquired one of those rare diseases, in which doctors cannot diagnose. Since he lost strength at times and reached such a degree of prostration that it was feared would not be able to attend the trial. In the end, however, and as we have indicated, the oral trial began on March 6, 1906, inside the provincial prison of Seville, whose surveillance was reinforced by infantry troops, civil guard, and security police. The court was made up of the presiding magistrate, Mr. Carlos Toledano, Marquis of Santa Amalia, with Mr. Evaristo Alonso and Mr. José Barbera, and the public prosecutor was represented by Mr. Ángel Fernández. The jury was made up of twelve men of goodwill, chaired by Mr. Vicente Espinoza Morales, and they all swore to abide by the law and comply with it. The defense of José Muñoz was in charge of Don Antonio Andrew Y. Cabano and that of L. Francis was taken over by the lawyer Mr. Romero. When the defendants appeared before the tribunal, their appearance could not be more deplorable. One Andres Aldige seemed to have aged 20 years, while his accomplice, José Muñoz Lopra, offered an extremely deplorable appearance, since he had to be led into the room seated in an armchair by four nurses, two of whom stayed behind. His care, just as the prison doctor, Dr. Lemus, had to be present. El Mosca Verde remained almost the entire time with his head resting on a pillow, with a foreboding expression that failed to soften his judges. It has been said that this attitude was deliberate, previously studied by the skillful advantage player, with which he intended to delay his judgment. Or was it Munoz Lopra's defender, the lawyer Antonio Andrew, who induced his client to feign the comedy of a disease that not even the doctors knew what to attribute to? As soon as the trial began, a scandalous incident occurred, since Antonio Andrew, resorting to his prerogative and with the penal code at the ready, requested the suspension of the hearing, alleging the condition of his client, who complained as if he were dying. And it was evident that his weakness and prostration was such that he could not even speak, as well as that it was impossible for him to provide any information for his defense. The president of the court, Mr. Carlos Toledano, Marquis of Santa Amalia, replied to the defense lawyer that the court, in anticipation of what might happen, since it was aware of the defendant's illness, had already ordered Jose to undergo a medical examination. Munoz, and, verified by competent doctors, declared that the defendant could speak, if he wished. They also could not explain what the defendant's illness was. 
Thus, a controversy began between the public prosecutor's office and the two defenders, resorting to numerous articles of the criminal procedure law, and all of this was recorded in the minutes. We free the reader from these legal incidents, although it is necessary to point out some of the words of Mr. Antonio Andrew, who proposed. Let's suspend the hearing and there will be no need to execute my defendant. Can't you see that he is dying? The president of the court, not without a certain Andalusian irony, replied. Precisely and as it is grotesque that this instruction has lasted six years, let us end the case with a sentence. In the end, the chamber agreed to continue the hearing and the protest was recorded in the minutes. First, the public prosecutor questioned José Muñoz Lopra, who, as if he had not heard, refused to answer. This required the intervention of the provincial prison doctor, who said. If the defendant does not answer, it is because he does not want to. Then, the prosecutor read out the statements by José Muñoz, which led to a new protest by Don Antonio Andrew. But the statements were read, from which it is clear that he is the author, together with Juan Andres Aldige, of the crimes that are imputed to them. Giving numerous details and details of the deaths carried out in the fateful orchard of El Francis, both in the acts carried out by him and in those carried out by his accomplice. Later, José Muñoz Lopera was asked to acknowledge his signature, stamped on the statements read, but it could not be achieved. It was necessary to continue the hearing, and the public prosecutor questioned one Andres Aldaich, who asked. Is it true that you were sentenced in France to 20 years of forced labor? Smiling quietly, the Frenchman replied. I ignore it. Can you tell us if José Muñoz Lopera is an advantage player? Don't know. But I do know that he is very light-handed. Later, he admitted that he had given his house to José Muñoz to organize card games with the wealthiest residents of Penaflor, but he flatly denied having participated in the murders of the six disappeared persons and that he did not take part in the money and jewelry robberies, to finish by saying, I didn't bury anyone in the orchard. All this is pure nonsense and everything I had declared in this regard was torn from me through beatings and torture. Next, the public prosecutor's office read him his own statements, in one of which he clearly confessed to being the author of several deaths, attributing others to Munoz. But he only recognized the signature. He denied that the text was true. The documentary evidence ended with the reading of the letters from the widows of Federico Lamas and Enrique Fernandez Cantalapedra, both addressed to José Munoz, since both knew that their respective husbands had met him. The prosecutor pointed out the fact that the investigating judge, upon learning of those letters, focused his investigation on Penafor, because both were addressed to the same individual. And it was this that marked the starting point for the clarification of the disappearances. The coroner also testified and his report explained in detail the injuries that caused the death of the six victims, all of the same style, and which coincided perfectly with the statements that appeared in the summary. Other witnesses did not clarify anything more regarding the facts, but they did expand the knowledge that was had of the victims, their legal heirs and other details. The public prosecutor, represented by Mr. Unhel Leon Fernandez, then addressed the members of the jury and asked them to estimate the facts objectively, adding that, since the crimes had been amply proven, as well as the guilt of the accused, the verdict that they had to dictate was the only fair one, that is, that of guilt. Next, the prosecutor related the facts and studied one by one all the evidence that he described as conclusive, as well as entertaining himself by analyzing the attitudes of the two defendants during the oral trial. He said that José Muñoz's silence was a pure comedy or a comfortable position and that if he did not want to speak it was so as not to confess his repugnant crimes. If this ingenuous maneuver could produce the effect that the defendant intends, from now on no defendant would speak. Can you imagine our courtrooms turned into theaters for occasional comedians? This would be the rampage or the school of mockery. This man does not speak, not because he is sick, but because he does not want to. 
We all know that he is a cynic and that your audacity to use Jose Lopez Almila's jewelry before the dead man's own father. But he is not innocent, since he knew, and he said it in his statements, where the body of Jose Almila was buried. Mr. Angel Leon Fernandez later went on to refer to the refusals of the Frenchman, saying that the system of denying what he had previously confessed to before the investigating judge and the civil guard did not indicate anything other than not being a confession of flat, it was not knowing what to say. But that systematically denying what on the other hand was amply proven was foolish. No one can deny the existence of six corpses in the orchard owned by this man. Who put them there if they were not the accused, using ruthless and bestial methods? The prosecutor went on to say that the defendant's confessions in the loot issue had been carefully substantiated through the statements of the victim's relatives. And there was the fact of the jewelry that had been taken from them. He explained that the robbery carried out by the defendants to their victims, counting the value of money, jewelry and clothing, was as follows. To Mr. Jose Lopez Almila 94 17 pesetas. Mr. Mariano Benito Burgos 8000. Mr. Enrique Fernandez Cantala Pedra 270. To Mr. Federico Lamas de la Torre 4000. Mr. Felix Bonilla Padilla 6834. Mr. Miguel Regano 7000. In total 35,521 pesetas. Next, Mr. Angel Leon Fernandez expanded on the explanation of the aggravating factors of premeditation, treachery, nocturnal activity and abuse of superiority. The facts are clear as daylight and we only need to have seen them with our own eyes. Therefore, there is no greater security or absolute certainty than in this case, which has been given to us completely resolved by the defendants themselves and the jury cannot issue a guilty verdict with a clearer conscience. When the public prosecutor concluded its report, the lawyer Mr. Federico Herrero took the floor, as a private accuser named by the widow and children of Miguel Regano, the last of the defendant's victims. It was he, as we already anticipated, who broke down the crime, describing it with sinister nuances and impressing the jury in the room with the description he made of handling the hammer, wielded by Jose Munoz when the Frenchman had already knocked down his victim from a tremendous blow, with an iron, on the head. Then, they searched his clothes and robbed him. But who can assure us that Miguel Regano or any of his other victims was not, in addition to being beaten, robbed and mocked, buried alive under a layer of lime? How did these two soulless know that Miguel Regano was already dead when they buried him in that sinister orchard? Don Federico Herrero made many of the attendees swallow saliva, leaving in the air an aspect of death that no one had dared to expose. And then he endorsed the rest of the tax report and insisted on the relevance of the aggravating factors, finally asking for the guilty verdict. Next, the defense spoke, represented by the lawyer Antonio Andrew Y. Cabano, regarding Jose Munoz Lopra. My defendant, he began by saying dash, as you have been able to fully appreciate, is in such a state of prostration that not only has he not been able to answer during the trial, but he has also not been able to enlighten his defender with those data and details that perhaps could have or at least tried to prove his innocence. And this, whichever way you look at it, amounts to helplessness. In addition, nothing has been proven in the oral trial. He continued to expand on reasons that did not convince anyone and ended up asking for a guilty verdict. It was a very unconvincing defense, everyone assumed that Munoz's illness was a ruse and could not help him. Later, it was the turn of the lawyer, Mr. Romero, defending Juan Andres Aldige, who began by saying that the confessions in the summary were invalid, in his opinion, naturally, since they were completely absurd and largely contradictory. They are absurd by themselves, he declared, because no one who makes sense would think of acknowledging the crimes that carry a penalty, which I cannot mention because the law prohibits it, but which everyone knows is horrible. And all of us who are here, he continued saying, know it, even the most inexperienced in legal matters among those in the public, know it. And this penalty, 
this kind of penalty can only be imposed in the face of absolute, total, overwhelming certainty, which leaves no loophole, no possibility open to the contrary thesis, to that of innocence. None of the sentences that have been handed down in the world, it does not matter here in which country, since justice is international, has ceased to have a look, an aspect of justice, we cannot admit that the men dedicated to the administration of this almost divine activity, which is an unfading gift. A science and at the same time a practice of the finest psychological insight, boast of the knowledge of the human being, that these judges acted according to the lightly, they did not put all their attention, all their effort, all their knowledge in handing down just rulings. And yet, the enormous number of known judicial errors suggests that all caution is insufficient when judging a fellow man. That is why I ask you that, in the absence, in my opinion, of conclusive, absolute, resounding evidence, as long as there is a doubt, a sentence cannot be imposed, and less than the caliber of those requested here. The defender of Juan Andres Aldige, alias L. Francis, limited himself to covering the file, he knew very well that it is impossible to defend the indefensible. The jurors then withdrew to deliberate while an ominous and tense silence fell in the room. No one expected irregularities or surprises. Everyone seemed convinced that the verdict was going to be affirmative. It happened, however, that during the deliberation the members of the jury had appointed a new president, named Jose Linen Camacho, who read the 68 questions that had been addressed to the People's Court. And they were all followed by a resounding, yes. The last four questions, and which admitted palliatives, were answered by the jury with, no. Once this legal procedure was completed, the professional magistrates handed down the sentence. And, indeed, after the deliberation of the magistrates, the president of the room read the sentence by which each one of the defendants, Jose Munoz Lopera and Juan Andres Aldige, was imposed six death sentences, as well as the payment of the compensation requested by the public prosecutor's office. The destruction of the iron bar and other artifacts used during the crimes was also ordered. Then the minutes were read. The two defendants listened to the sentence without flinching, giving evidence not only of indifference, but also of cynicism. In the end they refused to sign the notices. All sentences that carry capital punishment are considered automatically appealed. Therefore, the defender does not need to file an appeal, since the sentence is sent to the Supreme Court for review. In that specific case, on the fifth day after the sentence was issued, the appeal was returned, confirming the sentence imposed. No one recommended the commutation, nor did the Supreme Court. Therefore, to close the case, all that was missing was compliance with the executions. The executory notification was then sent to the investigating court so that it sent the copy of the testimony of the sentence to the civil prison. Don Antonio Andrew, Jose Munoz's defense lawyer, alleged his client's illness, saying that the court was already aware of it and, therefore, the sentenced man could not be executed. This is how a question was raised about which there were not many precedents, since, in conscience, could the law execute a sick man, or should it wait for his recovery to execute him? While waiting, couldn't the prisoner die? The defense attorney argued that it bordered on cruelty, since the very seriousness of the sentence, forced to take the life of the convicted person, required that he be alive. Wasn't the sentence broken by executing a dying man, as if the executioner did only half his work. To all this, the prosecutor reported saying that, the minimum aptitudes necessary are for activities that require a normal state of full physical faculties, but for compliance with the sentence, which are not essential. The room resolved an agreement with the prosecutor. The defense appealed and was denied. The case was about to be closed and since all the efforts of the defense were useless, on the morning of the first day of April 1906, in the provincial prison of Seville, the two inmates suffered execution by means of the vile garrote. José Muñoz Lopra had to be taken to the gallows, claiming that he could not walk. Two guards carried him in their arms. The Frenchman came by his own foot, but he did not smile. 
both died terrified and received no compassion from anyone. His crimes, sufficiently proven, were so horrendous that they did not deserve forgiveness. Let us trust that God has had mercy on his souls. And with this we conclude this fascinating immersion in the story of Juan Andres Aldige Monmeja, L. Francis, a case that has undoubtedly left us with chills. I want to thank you all for joining us at La Criminotica on this exciting journey through Spain's criminal past. It is gratifying to see how our content is capturing the interest and attention of our beloved audience. On this July 26th, I want to express my deepest gratitude for the support you have given us. Every like, comment and subscription is an impulse that motivates us to continue bringing intriguing and captivating content. If you liked this episode and you are passionate about the world of criminology and historical cases, I encourage you to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future content. Also, share this video with your friends and family so that more people can join our La Criminotica community and explore together the darkest mysteries of criminal history. We are excited to have you as part of our audience and hope to see you again in future episodes. Until the next date, with more intriguing cases in La Criminotica. Thank you for being part of this exciting experience.